Folks, UFC 294 is almost here. It's coming up this Saturday, this weekend. We've got some big main events. we got some crazy fights, lots of short notice replacements. So this is going to be a fun one. So grab your notebooks, grab your pencils, be ready to take some notes because we're going to break down the entire UFC 294 fight card, the entire gosh darn thing. But also, real quick, hey, follow me on Twitter, 138 MMA, Tapology. That's where you can find my picks, for my picking percentage, all that good stuff. Um, I don't let you see my picks on there until after the fight or till the time of the fight. So you can't see them there, but you can see them in this video. So that works out great for you. Um, in addition to that, Patreon, patreon.com slash 138 MMA, where you're going to get all of my notes. You're going to get the stuff you see on the marker board, plus a few others here and there. You're also going to get access to my picks with confidence ratings. So I give you a scale. I tell you how it's read and you, you can see my picks there. You also get my top five bets of the week. So whether that be just for UFC, UFC and Bellator, whatever, top five bets. Last week, we did fantastic on that. We hit four out of five bets. Always good. We had a great card last week. If you don't remember, we went nine and two. Not a bad night, I'd say. Now, uh, also on patreon.com slash 130MMA, you get the last thing, the Patreon parlay. Now, that what that is, you got your base leg. That's going to get you around even money. We're going to add an extra leg if you're getting wild. And we add a degenerate leg if you're a total wild person like most of you are. So we got all that. That's on Patreon. Also, Grey Dog Software, check them out. If you want to be become your own Dana White, book your fights, book your make your promotions, book your matchups, whatever you want to do. You want to run the promotion from top to bottom. Make it just how you want it. Change the rules. Make stomps allowed. Whatever you want, you could do that. World of Mixed Martial Arts 5. Grey Dog Software is the company that creates it. You can get the link in the, in the description of this video. It's going to be a great time. Check out the game. If you got some free time, you're going to love it. Now, let's get into these fights. We've got some really fun ones. Let's get to that first one. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Here at 185 pounds, we have Bruno Silva. He's taking on the newcomer, the undefeated prospect of Shara Magomedov. Magomedov is 5 0 in the last five because he's 11 0 on the career, undefeated, looking to keep that going. He's taking on Bruno Silva, a UFC vet with two and three in the last five. And you might think, what the heck? He's had a step up in competition recently and he's won some and he's lost some, right? So for Bruno Silva, not the best last five, but he's still 23 and nine on the career, still not a bad resume. He's fighting Shara Magomedov, who, like I said, is making his debut. So let's take that into account. Now, for Magomedov, dude's got solid striking, right? It's, the kicks are fantastic. He has a wide variety of them. He can throw combinations where he mixes his punches and kicks together. I actually like his spinning attacks pretty well. I still give it a, like, a, eh, you know, because occasional like, spinning attacks, just, they have risk built into them, right? There's very few times that a spinning attack does not have risk and, you know, especially if you're using him as an offensive strike rather than like a defensive move, you're going to end up with that risk being amplified, right? So takedown defense, not the best either, but he's fighting another striker in Bruno Silva. Bruno Silva, use a solid striker with a massive amount of combo or a massive amount of power, sorry. He has good combinations and he can throw knees middle of the combination. And that's something that you want to see from him. This dude has 20 KOs and 23 wins. Yeah, he's got massive power. Let's put it that way. Uh, dude's got good grappling as well, and if he gets on top of you, that ground and pound is absolutely vicious. He's going to be putting your head through the mat. Here's the deal, guys. It's It would be really easy to take Shara Magomedov here, right? Undefeated prospect, coming in, fighting the guys two and three in his last five. But am I crazy to think that over at over plus 200 odds, a guy with 20 KOs in 23 wins can't land a shot on the guy's blind side. He's got one eye. I understand, yeah, be great. He can do anything with, with that anybody with two eyes can do, whatever. He still has one eye. It, this guy hits like a train. You don't think that if he lands one shot on the blind side, he's going to drop Magomedov? I think he does, and I think at over plus 200 odds, I've got to take a shot on Bruno Silva. Give me Bruno Silva to get the win, and if he loses, you can come back and call me a clown. That's fine. We're picking the guy with two eyes in a fight. All right. Anyway, see you guys in the next fight. Let me know who you have in the comments. Straw weights up next. We have Jin Yu Fry taking on Victoria Dudakova. Dudakova's undefeated now. She's a 7-0 prospect, 5-0 in the last five. She's taking on Jin Yu Fry, who's been in a bit of a rough patch since getting to the UFC. She's 2-3 and three in her last five. She's 38 years old, and she's taking on the young prospect in Dudakova, who's two, uh, 24 years old. Going to be tough here, but let's break it down just in case. Now, for Victoria Dudakova, she's a good wrestler. 
the body lock takedown is kind of her best way to get the fight to the mat. She doesn't use a lot of traditional, you know, singles and doubles and things like that. When she does get to the mat, she's got pretty good control. She's best when she can take the back if she's able to get there. Uh, she does sometimes have trouble getting to the back, but once she does, she does a good job. She's willing to attack submissions, particu particularly the uh, rear naked choke. Uh, when she goes for the choke, you know, she's she's aggressively looking to get the finish. She's not just using it as something to control. Uh, she is looking for that finish. But one thing I hate is that she will give up top position in order to get the fights in the mat if she's struggling to get the takedown. I absolutely can't stand that. But she does usually be able to um, work her sweeps, get to the top, and then use her, you know, her ability from there. But I do hate when people pull people down to the mat and give up top position. It just looks bad, especially to the judges. So there's that. Uh, Decent striking. I'm being generous here. She's got good long straights and she's pretty tough. Let's put it that way. But she's definitely more of a wrestler than she is a striker. When it comes to Fry, decent striking, right? Uh, good combinations when she throws them. Good forward pressure. She's going to pump the jab out there pretty often. Um, the volume's usually kind of on the lower side, but every now and then you see a glimmer where you go, okay, okay, that's what she could do with a high pace. Uh, decent wrestling. She's got good takedown defense and she's actually pretty good when she gets her opponent pushed up against the cage. Working the cage push there. Her biggest problem in the UFC, though, I do believe, is the fact that she's a natural atom weight. So 115 pounds is just, it's just she's just going to be not built for 115, right? She's built for someone that can cut down to atom weight and do a good job there. You got to take Dudikova here. I understand why anybody would be hesitant, just for like you know the eh, striking, the willing to pull, willingness to pull someone on top. I get it, but Dudikova is probably the better pick here. That's who I'm going with. Let me know who you have. Right, so we get a matchup fight. at featherweight. We've got Nathaniel Wood taking on Muhammad Naimov. Naimov is 4-1 in the last five, 4-1 for Wood as well. Interesting matchup because realistically this is uh, the featherweight debut for Naimov in the UFC. He did take that, his last fight on short notice to get him into the UFC. Got the win there, and uh, here he is now. So what do we see from Naimov? Well, he's got good wrestling, uh, good top pressure. But his takedown defense isn't as good. So basically, he's a good offensive wrestler. Defensive is, you know, not as good. Striking, he's got he's got a uh, taekwondo background, from my understanding. He's got really good kicks at range, good power, good power in the hands as well as the kicks. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of where we're at. Obviously, we saw him get the knockout in his last matchup. So there's that. Uh, on the Nathaniel Wood side, though, for Wood, he's got good grappling and good sprawl. Can, you know, stuff takedowns with that. He's got a good takedowns of his own. Mixes them in with his strikes. Does a good job of, uh, you know, taking advantage of the, the blending of the mixed martial arts. You know what I mean? Uh, got good opportunistic subs. When he finds that opening, he jumps on it, does what he needs to do, gets it done that way. In the striking, he's incredibly technical, and the leg kicks are probably my favorite part about this. He has very solid leg kicks, works them, gets, gets the guy slowing down, gets his opponent slowing down, then starts styling on him with combinations, which he's got great combinations. He's very accurate with his hands and his kicks, but he's just accurate in general. Uh, the one problem for Nathaniel Wood, he's quite small for featherweight, um, and well, I guess two problems. We've seen his cardio fade in the past, right? As the, if if he's in a high pace fight, Nathaniel Woods' cardio does fade a bit. Now, it fades less at featherweight than it did down at bantamweight, but it is something to take into account. But he is a small featherweight. He's going up against a guy who just fought at lightweight, albeit on short notice, but still made you know a lightweight matchup and won. So. That is going to be tricky, but I do still think Nathaniel Wood gets this one done. I think he's a better fighter skill for skill, and I think he's going to be enough ahead in the skills that he's going to be able to edge this one out, probably on the scorecards. But let me know what you think. I'm going with Nathaniel Wood, and I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Wait, it's on the docket next. We have Anshul Jubilee. He's taking on Mike Breeden. Mike Breeden is 2-3 and three in his last five fights. Jubilee is undefeated at 7-0, so 5-0 in the last five. In this one here, we've got an interesting stylistic matchup because Breeden... Good striker, right? He's going to come forward, throw a bunch of volume, throw his combinations, and then he's going to counter back. Even when you connect on him clean, he's going to take the shot, strike back. And he does a gosh darn good job of it, at least on the regional scene. And the UFC he has not had as much success. Could this be his time? Who knows? He's lost some good competition in the UFC, so it's not like it's not like he's out there getting beaten by bums. So take that into account. Now, when he gets taken down, he typically tries to work back to his feet as quickly as possible. But we have seen him taken down quite a few times now. When we're looking at the other side, Anshul Jubilee. Jubilee is a, he's a good striker, right? He's got good boxing combinations. He works his jab well. He has good, pretty good volume. The head movement, I do like. His head's kind of moving a lot. He uh, doesn't just like doesn't let his head sit on the center line like you see a lot of guys do. He's got that boxing style, basically, right? Boxing in the hands, wrestling for the grappling, right? 
Uh, he does work his body well, or work the body well with those uppercuts, hooks to the body, stuff like that. Does a good job there. Uh, in the wrestling, his offensive takedowns are just all right. But once he gets on top, the pressure is pretty gosh darn good. Uh, his defensive takedowns, well, he's got pretty good takedown defense. And a lot of times he will reverse the position. Now, I don't think Breeden's going to be shooting takedowns in this matchup. So you can almost ignore this part right here. In fact, we're just going to do that. All gone. Look at that. The magic of marker boards. Now, what we've got here. So basically, it's going to be a striking matchup until this comes into play, right? So we've got this here. Is the X Factor for Jubilee. Jubilee, if he can get his wrestling going, I think he has a pretty good advantage over Breeden. In the striking, although I do think Jubilee has better good, uh, better striking, I think Breeden also has like style that will make a guy like Jubilee struggle a bit with the volume that he's got, the way that he just takes a shot and just keeps firing back. So unless Jubilee can knock him out, which it's possible, uh, I do think Breeden's going to give him a little bit of trouble on the feet, but I think the wrestling is going to get going at some point, and I think Anshul Jubilee is going to get this one done probably a later finish. Not first round, probably like end of second, third round, something like that. So that's where I'm at. Give me Jubilee to get this one done. Let me know who you have in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next fight. matchup here that I think is pretty tough to call, honestly. We have Abu Azaitar taking on SD Dumas. Uh, both guys are 4-1 in their last five, but here's the deal. Dumas has been a lot more active. He's younger. He's 28 years old as opposed to the 37 for a Zytar. He's taller and longer. He's 6'2 with a 79-inch reach as opposed to the 5'9", 76-inch reach of a Zytar. 76-inch reach for someone 5'9", though, is freakishly long, so there's that to take into account. But either way, Dumas has been fighting recently, whereas a Zytar, I haven't seen him in ages, right? I'm sure you haven't either. He hasn't just hasn't been fighting. And he's old enough that you're wondering why. Uh, so that's a problem. But Dumas, much younger, much more active. There's that. Both of these guys, though, are 4-1 and one in the last five. So you got to think about it. Okay, Azaitar, 14-3-1 on the career. So it's not like he's just, you know, was on a slump and then took some time off. No, he's 4-1 in his last five. He only got three losses on the career. Dumas, still coming up. So there's that. It's kind of an interesting matchup. It's tough for me to call because let's start on the Azaitar side. Dude's going to come forward with a ton of power in the striking. He's going to kind of blitz in. He's got good body work, and he works the legs well with those leg kicks, right? He's a pretty good striker, but the problem is his cardio fades, and he's not so good at defending takedowns. On the other hand, we have Dumas, who's also a powerful striker. He's got an awesome head kick. I do that's, it's, it's good. It's a good head kick. He's got good straights at range, but he is wide open to be encountered because he just kind of leaves his chin up. Uh, in the wrestling, he likes to pick guys up, slam them down really hard. Uh, his takedown defense isn't the best, but he's got a very quick guillotine. I really struggled with this one. And guys, I'm going to take a Zytar. And the reason why is because Dumas went to decision with, with a Cody Brundage that was literally trying to be beat. Just jumping guillotine, just not looking to win, just straight up looking to be finished. And Dumas couldn't do it. I'm going to take his eye tar to probably crack him at some point, catch the chin, and knock out Dumas. I could be totally wrong, and if I am, yeah, I mean, that's fine. I'll accept it. I'll be wrong on this one. Uh, but I'm taking his eye tar. I think he catches him at some point. Let me know who you have. I'd love to hear from you guys. Hopefully your insight on this is better than mine. I'll see you in the next one. Bantamweight fight. banger here between a couple of fighters who are so almost surprisingly similar in their fighting style and in their, their way that they fight. So, Javid Basharat, he's coming in, defending his undefeated streak, 14-0 so far in the career, 5-0 in the last five. He's taking on Victor Henry. Now, Victor Henry, he's 3-2 in his last five. He has been a little bit inconsistent, but both these guys fight very similarly. And Victor Henry has made a career out of beating guys that he just shouldn't beat. And then he comes in, gets the job done. So let's break this fight down. Now, Victor Henry, 23-6 and on the career. The guy's got a ton of experience, way more experience than a guy like Basharat. So... That, that's going to be something we have to take into account, right? Similar styles, one with more experience, one with the youth. That's where we're at. Now, for uh, Victor Henry, like I said, similar here. So we got solid striker. He's got a ton of volume, just volume-heavy approach, good movement on the feet. He's got an excellent body kick, and he's looking to counter-strike his opponents a lot of the times while he's using that volume. So he's throwing his volume, and then he counters back when somebody tries to hit him, when they try to counter his volume, right? Solid grappling. That a very large toolbox. He uses his, just like an overwhelming amount of ground and pound to advance his position. So he's just throwing shots like crazy. And then the second that you start to defend the shots instead, that's when he moves to the next position, moves his way up. 
Um, and he does mix his takedowns very well in with his strikes. I probably should have flip-flopped those. Either way, mixes the takedowns in well with the strikes. That volume heavy coming up top. And then he just throws the takedown in there, gets you down. Now, like I said, he's a bit inconsistent because, like, you know, he beats the guys that you, he shouldn't beat. But then every now and then he'll lose to somebody that, you know, like, what? I thought for sure you were going to get this one. It happens. Uh, he does have great cardio, though. The way he can keep up this volume heavy approach throughout five, or three rounds, he does a good job. Now, for Bashrat. Very similar, right? He's got solid striking as well. He's got plenty of good movement. He's got a good good amount of volume as well. He's got good counter striking in as well. Like I said, they're very similar. He does work the body. He's got good knees up the middle. They're very similar. Now, in the grappling, a large toolbox, heck of a scrambler, and he's going to attack the chokes predominantly. Now, those chokes are what he looks for on the ground. Yes, I'm sure he knows other submissions. He's got a large toolbox, but that's what his go-to is. He's looking for the chokes, right? Got good cardio as well. What do I see in this fight that tells me one guy should be the favorite. I've got to say it's the youth. It's the youth and the uh, the momentum. So I'm going to take Basharat. I don't like the odds. He's a bit too high on the odds for where this is at. But you got to go with the younger guy. You got to go with the guy that I think is on a hot streak now and I think going to probably continue that on. So for me, I'm taking Basharat. Less confident than minus 625 or whatever he is. But let me know what you think. Maybe you think it's justified. If so, drop it in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next fight. About Muhammad Yaya taking on Trevor Peak. This one should be fun because Trevor Peak doesn't know how to have a boring fight, and Yaya's here to be his dance party. So here's what we got: four and one in the last five for Peak. We got five and zero oh in the last five for Yaya. Peak's only loss coming to Chepe Mariscal in his last matchup, where that was a blast of a fight. It was super fun to watch. Both guys get just brought it to the dance. Here we go. This one, Trevor Peak. He's a decent wrestler, right? Decent takedowns, not the best takedown defense, but he works his way back up on the feet. So he's not super technical in his wrestling. He's not super technical on the feet either. But he's got good, powerful striking with a ton of forward pressure and a ton of volume. That's what he does. He fights at an extremely high pace. It's tough as nails, and that's what he does, right? Because he doesn't block a lot of shots except for with his face, but he can eat them. And when he comes forward, he's going to wing these wild, big, powerful shots coming from whatever angle. Uh, problem is he throws these weird naked leg kicks from way across the cage not a good idea but you know what doesn't matter because when you hit him he's just gonna keep coming forward the dude's a zombie he's a freaking dog i would say that this guy is going to be one of the harder guys to finish in the entire ufc at this weight class so trevor peak absolute dog comes forward brings it right well he's fighting muhammad yaya now muhammad yaya has got pretty good power uh he likes to counter strike so sometimes his volume's a little bit low his defense isn't the best either because he's trying to pick his spots too much. Sometimes lacks defense. We've seen him get cracked a few times in his fights. Um, his takedown defense isn't great either, but I, realistically, I think Peak's first go-to is going to be the striking. So I think that's where we're going to get is probably a striking matchup. And I got to go Peak. I think Peak's going to be able to overwhelm him, come forward with a bunch of volume, throw these big power shots. I think it's just going to be too much for Yaya in this matchup. So for me, Trevor Peak's the pick. If you got him at plus money, that was a good play. Now, it, I mean, it's too late. I wouldn't play him now. But either way, Trevor Peak, I do like him to win this matchup. Let me know who you have. I'll see you in the All next All right, one. guys, we have an incredibly interesting matchup in the flyweight division next. It's Muhammad Makayev taking on Tim Elliott. Now, the reason this is so entertaining here, because Makayev, undefeated prospect, right? He's 9-0 on the career, 5-0 in the last five, obviously. He's taking on Tim Elliott, who's had a bit of a career resurgence. He's 4-1 in his last five fights at the age of 36. Now, that one loss, Mateusz Dikolau, that's a tough ask, right? I think Nikolaou is going to be a hard fight for most guys in the division. So if you lose to that one, it's not that bad of a, you know, not that bad of a loss. It doesn't look that bad. In this fight, he's fighting uh, Muhammad Rakhayev, who has not beaten anyone of the level of Mateusz Nikolaou. So yet to be seen whether he could, but he has not to this point. So 36 years of age for Elliott that is a red flag for him, but he does look good. Like I said, career resurgence. 23 years of age for Mukhayev, so he's probably making improvements in between his fights, getting better. But he's going up against a crafty veteran, and that shows in Tim Elliott's game. And we're going to cover that in a minute. Let's start with the Mukhayev side, though. Mukhayev, solid wrestler. He's got a variety of takedowns that he uses, and he, he uses these takedowns with a high volume. The reason he shoots a high volume of takedowns is sometimes he lets guys get back up, but he's able to take them back down to the mat, whether it's with a mat return or, you know, if they break free entirely, he'll shoot an entirely new takedown. Different, you know, different options for him. Get the fight back to the mat, and then he's going to attack his opponents there. Now, we find it, he finds himself in some submissions every now and then where, you know, they're deep, but he doesn't tap because he's a tough guy, fights his way out, and then he attacks the sub of his own, gets the submission over guys that have been previously trying to submit him, and it looks gosh darn impressive, but he's been in some close calls. 
Either way, he attacks the submissions well. He's got good scrambles to get himself on top if he ends up taking down because, you know, sometimes he does. His takedown defense is not as good as his takedown offense, but the scrambles do help. He's good at working for the submissions, like I said, and that's going to kind of round out his wrestling game. Now, in the striking, he's decent. It's his kicks that are his best part. He's got gosh darn good kicks. Best, best at full range all the way out, but he's got good kicks. And he's got cardio to make it work for the whole five, uh, four, three rounds, sorry. For the whole three rounds, 15 minutes, whatever. For Tim Elliott, he's a solid wrestler in his own right, okay? So for Tim Elliott, he's got a good takedown volume as well. He's just coming forward, whether it's with the unpredictable, unpredictable striking or the grappling, he's coming forward all the time. He's got great strike, uh, great scrambles as well. His pace that he puts on guys is relentless, especially early in a fight. But he has also very much submission over position, so he will give up positions in a fight. But the scrambles, they kind of make up for it as he goes along. He can get his position back. Now on the strike or on the feet, yeah, his striking super unorthodox. Has just wild, unpredictable movement, and that actually pays off well for him because the volume of strikes that he throws, he's able to land on these guys just where they don't really see it coming. And he does a good job, and then he gets the takedowns just over and over, and you know what? He's a dirty fighter. We saw it. He beat Tagiru on Bekov by being a gosh darn dirty fighter. Cheated his way to a victory there. I was pissed because I had bet on Tagir, but it worked for him. So Tim Elliott, dirty fighter. It pays off. He's a crafty vet. We'll call it veteran savvy, not just dirty, right? Who do I pick in this one? I... I'm going to go with Tim Elliott. And the reason why is because... I don't, I don't want to let the, the odds influence my pick. But he's a massive underdog. I think last I saw it was plus 350. Earlier today, I saw him over plus 400. Give me Tim Elliott. I, this, this is a close, close fight. But I'd rather be holding that ticket from Tim Elliott saying he's plus 350, plus 400, and, and he lose than holding that, that minus 600 or whatever, minus 500, 400, you know, whatever it is. For Makayev, and he lose. So there you go. Give me Tim Elliott. I'll take him in this matchup. I think it's a close fight. I really do. I think he's gonna be able to use this veteran savvy. He's probably gonna cheat his way to a decision win, and that's where I'm at. So give me Tim Elliott. Let me know who you have in the comments below. Like the video and I'll see you next matchup time. that I'm really looking forward to next. And hey, I haven't reminded you to do this. If you haven't done it already, like the video, would you? It's gonna really help out the channel, and I would appreciate the heck out of you if you do so. If you have already liked the video. Kudos to you. You did great. You're one of the real ones. But if you haven't done so yet, hey, I don't know that. Just go ahead and go down there. Click the like button for me. And then we're good. I'll, you get the applause as well, all right? In this one here, we have Saeed Nurmagomedov. He's taking on Muin Gafarov. Gafarov's 3-2 and two in his last five. 4-1 and one for Nurmagomedov. That one loss coming to Jonathan Martinez, who looked great last week. Um, we picked him. Good job, guys. You know, but um, I also I thought Saeed won that fight. But either way. We've got a pretty good one here. Uh, Gafarov, he's a decent striker with pretty darn good power. Um, he's durable as heck, but the problem is he loops his shots and he's wide open to counters when he does that. So on the feet, good power, durability, not so technical, right? Good wrestling. He's got decent takedowns and he's a very good back taker when he does get you to the mat. Taking the back is his specialty. Now, when it comes to Saeed Nurmagomedov, Dynamic striker with a very large toolbox, right? He's got excellent kicks, and he uses his spinning attacks very well. His spinning attacks aren't these, like, wild spinning moves that just get him taken down and stuff like that. His spinning attacks are well-timed, accurate. He does a gosh darn good job with it. Uh, in the grappling department, Saeed's got nasty front chokes. He's very quick on them, whether that be the ninja choke, the Dars choke, the anaconda, doesn't matter. He's got them all. Decent takedowns if he needs to get the fight to the mat, but typically he's going to be wanting to strike. Um, but he's difficult to hold down when he is taken down. Guys, I think this one's going to be a slaughter. Saeed Nurmagomedov is the far better fighter here. Give me Saeed Nurmagomedov. Let me know what you have. If you're on Gafarov, let me know why. I'd love to hear it because I don't see it. I'm thinking Nurmagomedov beats this one or wins this one pretty easily. Let me know. I'll see you now, in the next one. One of many short-notice matchups in this one here. We're at the 185-pound middleweight division. Worley Alves steps in on short-notice to, to take on Ikram Aliaskarov. Ali Skarov is 5-0 in the last five fights. He's only had one loss on his career. Alves, 2-3 and three in the last five. So he has been in a bit of a rough patch lately. And now he's taking this one on short notice. Let's see how this one's going to play out, right? Alves, he's a good striker. He's a good striker. He's got plenty of power. He's got, you know, comes forward with his combinations, does what he needs to do. The kicks are his best thing when he's striking, from my opinion. 
Um, he's got an excellent body kick. It's it's powerful. Um, and he can double up the kicks on the same side. So just snapping that same leg up quick just without having to without having to reset each time. He does a good job there. On the mat, he's even better. He's got solid Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, he's got a very large toolbox, but his guillotine is his best weapon. Um, he attacks his submissions pretty, uh, pretty effectively. Doesn't just kind of wait for opportunities. He makes you give him something. Um, the one thing I don't like, though, is that he'll pull guard. And he's usually looking for that guillotine, so I understand it. But I hate guys that pull guard, especially against wrestlers. Now, here's what he's fighting. Ikramelia Skarov, a solid wrestler, right? He's got good takedowns. Solid top pressure, very, very good on top, very good ground and pound, and he's got a Kimura to boot. So not only can he just get down there and just beat your face in on the ground with his ground and pound, but he can rip your arm off as well. Ikram Ali Iskarov on top is very, very dangerous. And the striking, he's got good forward pressure. He's not the best striker, but he's pretty good. Uh, good clean straights, and he's got good kicks and knees up the middle. Uh, so the front kick and the knee, they look the same at the start of the setup, right? So when you, when you go to throw your front kick, you got your hip coming through, your push kick, your teeth kick, whatever you want to call it. They're all just variations of a front kick. Uh, so he, he goes to throw the hip, brings the knee through. Well, you can either go into a knee or you can start there and snap that front kick out. And there you go. So they look similar. It kind of hides that, disguises them. They go well together. He can do the same thing with his roundhouse kick where he can throw, throw that hip around, you know, land the roundhouse, but then change that to a knee as well. Does a good job. Uh, you got to go with Ali Skarov here. The guy, two and three in his last five, taking this fight on short notice against a guy who is just looking like an absolute world beater, um, just running guys over outside of the one loss, whatever. I got to go with Ikram. Let me know who you have, though. Do you think Worley's got a shot? If you do, let me know how you think so in the comments below. See you in the next this fight. This is the last matchup that I actually made my final pick on. I struggled with this one, and I don't know why. Actually, I do know why. But it's for a weird reason, right? We're in the light heavyweight division. We have Johnny Walker taking on Magomed Ankalaev. Now, when you look at it just on paper, you look at 21-7, and 3-2 in the last five, 18-1-1, one 4-0-1 one, oh in the last five. You're like, oh, yeah, Ankalaev is the obvious pick, right? But not so fast because Johnny Walker is a bit of an oddity, okay? Six foot six with an 82-inch reach already makes him a bit of an oddity. He's going against the 6'3", 75-inch reach of Ankalaev. Ankalaev is a normal person at 205, normal size. Johnny Walker has ridiculously long arms, and he's freakishly tall. There is that. Well, when you couple that with his abilities, he's a good striker in the fact that he's very wild and unorthodox, but when he hits you, it hurts because he's got 16 knockouts. He strikes in flurries. He has this crazy wild style that's good a lot of the time, but bad other times. He's toned it down some, but it's still kind of unorthodox. But his volume's super inconsistent. You don't really know what you're going to get in the volume. His grappling is like, you know, it's all right. It's improved, but he can be held down. But Johnny Walker is a wild card because he hits so freakishly hard. On the other side, Ankalaev. About as exciting as milk toast. Ankalaev, he's got good striking. He's got fast kicks, I'll give him that. Decent boxing combinations. He stays safe, though. And, and when he stays safe, what well, what happens is it's boring. Because he also is very patient on the offense. So, there's that. In the wrestling, yeah, he's got good top control, good takedown defense. His takedowns are good. They're not, uh, you know, they're not elite tier takedowns, but he's got good takedowns. Ankle has skill for skill, the better fighter. And I almost, almost talked myself into picking Johnny Walker because of this career resurgence he's had lately, but I can't do it. I've got to take Ankle although it's it's really a close fight because. If you're too patient and just trying to stay safe, which is what he's going to be doing, you can get caught. But I'm going to stick with Ankalaev. I don't know. I know a lot of people are on Johnny Walker this week, and I totally get why. I understand why they're taking Johnny Walker. I just can't do it. So Ankalaev is my pick. Let me know who you have, though. I'd love to hear from you guys. If you're on Johnny Walker, hey, big plus money. I don't blame you. Might as well play him by knockout. But either way, let me know. I'll see you guys in the next one. Last reminder, like the video. I appreciate it very much. Hey, so here we are, co-main event of the evening. If you made it this far, you've probably already watched my breakdown of the co-main event of the evening. In fact, you probably already watched my breakdown of the main event. So I'm not going to spend time going over those. They're popping up on the screen any second if they haven't already in a playlist labeled UFC 294. We can watch the main event and the co-main event breakdown in their entirety. Watch those there. The rest of the card here. You guys are going to have a great night. I got plenty of content for y'all. See you guys in the next breakdown.